Welcome to On Democracy, F.P. Wellman. I am F.P. Wellman. Welcome joining us on the Midas Touch Network tonight. CBS News had a poll come out this week of prob- possible, I guess, you know, likely Republican primary voters. And, and you got to believe, this thing's shocking. <laughs> it says uh, 2024 Republican uh, voters are exp- looking for a nominee and they prefer a candidate who won 85 percent of them wants him to challenge woke ideas 66 percent want to oppose any gun restrictions 61 percent they want a guy who will say trump won and then 57 percent want someone who makes liberals angry <laughs> and that is no shit the issues we face so a lot of us are constantly asking ourselves do we live in unprecedented times i'm not sure so I'm excited to have a guest this week that's going to ask that. I can ask that question, and he's going to answer. So let's get on with the show. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am Fred Wellman, as mentioned before the music. Uh, this is On Democracy. Hope you found the right place here on the Myers Touch Network and elsewhere. Uh, I am so excited to have you with us. I, I do keep asking myself if we live in historic times for years now. I and mean, as we've dealt with, uh, you know, the various issues, the books falling down, Matt, <laughs> you know, it, we've, uh, you know, it, 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 is this truly historic precedent? And I turn to history. I'm a student of history myself, not a professional, but I went to the military academy. I've studied these things and I constantly see myself turning to the past to understand where we are. So I'm really excited to have a, a guest who can actually put that perspective. And I, I, I've often turned to Kevin Cruz on Twitter or in a publication to put things in perspective and understand the moment we face. And he's very, very good at that. His writing has been really, I, I learned so much. And not to blow smoke up him, he's not on camera yet, I don't think. <laughs> but the underpinnings, for example, the underpinnings of modern traffic jams being rooted in segregation. Uh, he was part of the 29, you know, uh, he, he wrote a piece in 2019 for the 1619 Project. I've witnessed that here in St. Louis, where our highways are directed right through Richmond Heights, and we get a traffic jam where it dog legs around the nice neighborhood that's been there for 200 years. So I always turn to Kevin for that. So I'm thrilled to welcome Kevin Cruz to the show. Kevin, great to be here. Uh, Kevin is a professor of history at Princeton University, specializes in the political, social, and urban suburban history of 20th century America with a particular interest in conflicts over race, rights, and religion, the making of modern conservatism. Published books and dozens of articles, and your most recent publication here on the on the on the on the stand, which is too thick to sit on the stand that I have. We got to buy a new stand, Matt. <laughs> is Myth America? It's a collection of essays from historians taking on the biggest legends and lies about our past. Kevin's the co-editor of that. Kevin, welcome to the show. It's great to see you from coming and dialing in from Princeton in beautiful New Jersey. Still good to be here, Fred. <laughs> I appreciate that. You know, I um. I joke a lot that, and Matt's sick of it, I think, the joke, but I joke that I really only had this podcast to talk to cool people <laughs> and, and use an excuse for them to come see. Because <laughs> if I have a podcast, like, I can't just call you. So anyway, I've been wanting to talk to you for years. <laughs> Thanks for being my latest cool dude to hang out with. Um, you know, I really kind of want to jump right in with that big question, right? The yeah. big question from the top. Do we live on, uh, in unprecedented times? And can the history of this country tell us what comes next for all of us? I think that's sort of your basis for your work, right? I mean, do we face, yeah. is it truly an unprecedented time and what comes next? Well, look, I mean, I, as an historian, I'm required by law to answer. Nothing's truly unprecedented. <laughs> There's always, we can always, I think, I'll find a little bit of guidance in the past where we are. Right. And and yet we don't always copy the past either, right? I mean, you know, so Mark Twain's line, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Right. Uh, I think is 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 pretty apt. Uh, and as for where we go from here, again, as an historian, I'm required by law to tell you that my professional training is in hindsight. I'm really not trained well to make predictions, uh, but I'll try my best to try to maybe speculate a little bit here. But, but I, I do think, all joking aside, um, and those caveats aside, we really are uh, kind of off the rails here uh, in the last, uh, you know, we're kind of the Trump era, uh, really took a turn uh, and injected things into our uh, our politics, our political discourse, our public life. And we just thought weren't part of what this country was, right? And, and it's, it's what's really been alarming is how uh, normal uh, a lot of it has come to feel uh, in a short amount of time, right? Uh, and we all have that feeling of, oh, this is unprecedented. I and mean, it happens two or three times, and we suddenly think, oh, well, this is just the you know politics as usual. Right? Now it's precedent. So uh, <laughs> that's, I think, what uh, historians have to guard against is is actually uh, how abnormal some of this stuff is. Okay. Yeah. And and that's something, you know, I wrote a piece the other day for my Substack, uh, 
Make sure to subscribe. <laughs> and and it's um, I was joking at the end of the Substack talking about the Republican Party where they are today and how this party just I was a Republican until 2015 uh, voter. I was never an activist, but but again, this is I always say often on the show that this isn't the party I was part of. That this is uh, not. And I was that's why I joined the Lincoln Project. Uh, the Trumpism and this authoritarian movement has become very different. But a lot of people feel like they just can't accept that the party may be gone, right? And and again, look into history. In my Substack, at the end of it, I kind of <clears throat> I made a joke for a paragraph saying, hey, whatever happened to those wigs, <laughs> right? And, and the wigs went away, I think 1861, essentially with uh, the, just before the Civil War as the party split over slavery. So there, it's not, it, it has been unusual that we've had just two political parties essentially since the 1860s, but there's not, there is a precedent in the past that parties do go away, right? I mean, um, there, yeah. the, there isn't a sure thing that Republicans are gonna find. It. And this stems from my discussions a lot of where are the reasonable Republicans that are gonna save the party. Right. And a lot of us who are in, the, in this profession and say, well, it's not going to be saved. I mean, what does history tell us that, again, joking about the Whigs and all, it may not yeah. be your area, but you, you have watched this civil rights and the changes in our country, and here yeah, we are. Yeah, I mean, and the party system isn't fixed or permanent. We've we've had several iterations over uh, you know, three or four uh, major systems in the past. Uh, it's gotten a little more um, settled into our life uh, and, and kind of um, um, uh, cemented in ways that say the Whigs weren't secure. Uh, just for the fact that um, uh, uh, both the structures of politics from gerrymandering to um, uh, uh, kind of the regional split between the parties has really cemented a lot of uh, a lot of their holds here. Uh, they've got certainly um, a big media uh, and, right. and business interests backing up both parties uh, and that it might be a little harder to change. But yeah, nothing is permanent uh, in, in in any uh, uh, country's history, and certainly not in America. And what's really remarkable about the Republican change is, you know, uh, we often say this, you know, this isn't your father's uh, a party. It really isn't. Uh, no. My dad was a, a Republican, yep. uh, and uh, uh, the Republican of the Reagan era, you know, was kind of held together by three different coalitions, uh, three different parts of a coalition: the uh, the kind of the uh, um, uh, the, the libertarian. Uh, a, a strand, uh, the national um, uh, defense uh, focus, and social conservatives, right? And they were all kind of held together by really a, a general principle of get the government off our backs, right. right? And so groups that you normally would find at loggerheads of the libertarians and, and religious right agreed on that in 1980. They both have general complaints about the government. What happened, though, is as Republicans got into power um, and became the government, uh, arguments started to develop uh, between those groups, uh, and they found themselves more and more at, at odds. It's always been the kind of the, the social conservatives who want uh, the party to exercise government power on behalf of their causes have largely been a, a minor voice. But in the Trump era, the rest of the party has come around on this idea of using government power, right? We're seeing this all over in at the state level in particular. Yep. Uh, all of these laws about uh, what you can teach in school, about um, uh, trans rights, right. uh, about voting rights, about uh, uh, incarceration. Uh, there are a lot of real heavy-handed policies coming down by Republicans at the state level. And so the idea that this is the party that's going to get government off your back when it is the government uh, and in your lives, uh, you know, uh, very visceral things like abortion rights and, you know, um, uh, things like that. Uh, it really is a remarkable shift. So um, I, you're not alone in, in kind of questioning what's going on with the Republican Party. Right. And it's a very authoritarian shift. And 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 it does talk, we, as we talk of these shifts, you've studied extensively the shift. In the book, there's a great, we'll probably pull from the book quite a bit in this conversation. You know, one of my favorite uh, uh, Kevin Cruz things to do is torching Dinesh D'Souza regularly <laughs> on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the internet, on the Twitter machine. Um, and, and, and one of the, I think the, stra the chapter you wrote in the book is about that Southern strategy, that, that shift in the party. So, you know, that, and that is kind of where we are to, it, it is where we've been brought this day. Why do you think they cling to that idea that there wasn't. It, it seems like it's become, again, a part of this generation of Republican is yeah. denial that they were everything. It, it, is, it, is it because they have to deny they were other that other party? Or where is the basis of the Southern strategy and then the shift in the party? And and, and here we are today where it's, it's being yeah. denied. So yeah. And again, so we only have to go back like, you know, to the George W. Bush years right. to see the really remarkable change on this. So the Southern strategy, for those of you who don't know, is is in the really in the '60s, but also kind of longer than that, in both directions. Really in the '60s, it kind of came to the forefront. But the Republican Party uh, kind of turned the page on its old identity as the party of Lincoln, the party of civil rights, 
and decided that if it was going to win national elections, it had to make peace with Southern conservatives, Southern white conservatives. And the sticking point there was their record on civil rights. They reached out to segregationists and they welcomed them into the party uh, where they'd long been an odd. Now, this is an obvious story. And in the 60s, it is it unfolds in plain sight right. uh, in terms of, uh, of you know reporters covering it in real time. Politicians themselves making statements about what they're doing. I mean, I, as I talk about in the in the uh, the essay, you've got you know Bill Dickinson, one of the first Republican congressmen out of Alabama, when he switches from the Democratic Party, says, "I am joining the white man's party." It's wow. not subtle. <laughs> no, the Prentice Walker, the first Republican congressman from Mississippi, after he wins his election, uh, he again another former Democrat. He switched to the party because of civil rights. The first place he goes is to a, a meeting of the Association for the Protection of the White Race, a Klan front. This is not subtle. Right. The Mississippi Republican Party in 1964 puts an embrace of segregation in its official party platform in 1964. Again, none of this is hidden. And we've known about this. Again, if you look at the archives for Nixon and Goldwater, it's all over yeah. um, their private documents. Uh, they talk about it in their memoirs. Nixon's strategists talk about this in the press. Right. Kevin Phillips in 1970 is talking to the New York Times on the record about how they're going to get Negrophobe white voters in the South to switch to the Republican Party. OK, so all this was on the record, which meant in the Bush era, there was a really, I think, a sincere effort on the part of the Bush administration to own up to this and turn the page. Right. There was a real desire, I think, on the part of the Bush era Republicans. And whatever criticisms I have about Bush, I'm not a huge Bush fan, but at this point, I think there was a real sincere effort to turn the page. Bush himself, his cabinet was multiracial. We had Condi Rice and Colin Powell and Alberto yeah. Gonzalez tried to make real liberal moves on immigration reform. I think born out of his experiences in Texas, I think he understood that issue and really tried to try to change it. And as part of that, the party acknowledged this past and apologized for it. Mm -hmm. Two different chairmen of the RNC, Ken Melman and Michael Steele, at different times made speeches where they acknowledged this and apologized for it. I think it was a sincere effort to turn the page. Yeah. Well. Ten years later, we get into the Trump era, and rather than trying to turn the page from that racist past, they were doing policies that echoed it. And right. so they couldn't apologize for this thing because they thought there was nothing to apologize for. So some people struck upon a really interesting idea, which was to pretend it never happened, right? So D'Souza does a lot of this. A little scientist Carol Swain yeah. wrote a piece in which she, she did a thing for Prager University. That's the springboard for my, my piece in the Myth America collection. Yep about how the Southern strategy never happened and it was sim simply invented out of nothing by liberal academics in our own time. Wow. It's crazy. I mean, it is insane to argue this. The idea that I would have to write an essay showing that the Southern strategy was not a myth. If you told me that 10 years ago, I would have laughed at you. It was like, you know, it'd be like, you know, talking about the, the sun being the center of the solar system. I, right. I mean, you all know this, right? Right. So, but that's what I had to do in this piece. And uh, and uh, sadly, it's it's necessary because it's really been a push uh, on the part of these partisans to deny this very obvious fact of history. Do you think, I, I think it's almost like they want to embrace those policies. So you have to, <laughs> you know, you, you, you have to skip that middle part. And, and those yeah. who you just, everyone you just described is a rhino now, right? Bush, right, yeah. Like, I had Michael Steele yeah. on the show a couple of months ago, like, same thing. You know, we're all, those guys are the rhinos now yeah, because they want to accept this past and, and, and acknowledge it. It's, it's sad, but it does tie in. And, and let me just say, the really ironic thing here is that the people who see themselves as kind of the real defend, the, the, the real conservative Republicans. Right. In erasing the Southern strategy story, they're erasing the story of what Goldwater transformed the party, right? Of, of Reagan's transformations, right? They're ignoring the real work there, pretending that it was all kind of on autopilot from Lincoln to the day and nothing changed. It's really remarkable. It's bizarre. I mean, I can't tell you how often uh, my mentions, as I, I think I mentioned in our pre-show, how, how it's nice to read comments that don't hate me. <laughs> but the ones that do are always like, oh, you know, the Democrats, the KKK. I was like, yeah, thanks for that history lesson. I was I had no right. idea. <laughs> um, you know, I had the unique experience of living in Richmond um, during the George, George Floyd protest. And I actually attended several events around the Robert Lee, Lee Monument during that long occupation, that disgraceful monument to racism. Um, you know, a, a fascinating history there about how it was built. You know, why are these statues? I mean, again, tying into that, what we just talked about, where they're rewriting history, um, this passion for the monument. And the monuments matter so much. And I'll tell you a personal part of it. Um, the Charlottesville riots, and if those who watch the show are new, may not know, but my son-in-law is a National Guardsman of Virginia. At the time, he was a military policeman. My son-in-law guarded the Lee statue in Charlottesville during the Unite the Right rally. I have this 
visceral reaction to that day because I sat, I actually just got knee surgery. So I was stuck at home on a couch mm -hmm. watching my, and every now and then I'd catch a glimpse of the soldiers in uniform and riot gear in the distance defending a fucking statue um, from conservatives, I'm doing air quotes, uh, because of that. How does this, 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 all of a sudden, this, this we can't move on your monuments play into that? And why is it so important that right, these things don't come down or they become symbols for their movement? Yeah, yeah it's really, you know, the, the monument struggle is really interesting because the people who are defending them always say, this isn't about hate, this isn't about heritage, this is history we're, pretend, we're, right. we're protecting. It's now a history. Okay, uh, first of all, as an historian, let me just assure people listening at home, when we teach history, we actually don't use monuments. We use we use books and primary documents. That's weird. It's much easier to get them into the classroom than to lug a statue in. Okay, so first of all, that's not the point. Second of all, we have to remember these statues aren't some sort of history that was rooted in the South in 1865 and 1866, right after the Civil War, right? right. These are statues that were created long after the fact. Most of them in the 19-teens and 1920s, that kind of the depths of Jim Crow, yep. another wave in the 1950s and 1960s during the Civil Rights Movement. And there's no accident that they appear to most times because they were not an effort to preserve history. They themselves were an effort to rewrite history, to advance this idea of a lost cause in which the Civil War wasn't about slavery. It was a noble cause. It wasn't about a treason against the, the United States. Uh, these were good people and we should revere them. But also, we should revere the social order they represented. They were fighting to preserve slavery and white supremacy, and we need to hold that true today. And so you mentioned the one in Charlottesville. I went to school in Chapel Hill. Ah, there you go. And we had a statue there called Silent Sam. Silent Sam. And it was on, it was still on campus. It's gone now, but it was still on campus when I was there in the uh, in the 90s. Yep. And and we didn't really know the history of this. We knew it was vaguely Confederate, but in the time since, we've dug into the history of Silent Sam, and all you have to do to understand what these statues meant is to listen to the people who put them up. Right. All these speeches, uh, all these statues had speeches that were given of a dedication. The one in, in uh, Chapel Hill, the guy behind it literally says, when we put the statue up, I, he reminisces about how not far from here, I whipped a Negro wench until her shirt was dripping with blood, right? Aye. And this statue is to remind her and people like her of the proper order. Wow. It's not subtle, okay? I always said if somebody wants to defend a Confederate monument, they should have to go read the speech that was given to dedicate that monument to a multiracial crowd today and see if they can get through it without realizing what they're endorsing. Wow. So these statues were themselves an effort to rewrite history. And also, we often hear people say, oh, well, these were a product of their time. You can't yeah. judge them by 2023. These were a product of their time. Whenever they were done, the 1910s, and 1950s, these are a product of their time. No, people at the time saw what these were about. Yep. People at the time objected to them. Yep. And if you and if you read this essay by Karen Cox in Myth America, who tackles this brilliantly, Karen notes that when these monuments went up, people were objecting to them. They were largely African Americans in the North, right? And right. so if you count them as people, and I think you should, yeah. then you can't say no one objected to them. People saw them at the time for what they were, and we've got to see them uh, for what they were right now. That's brilliant. And, and it, that ties nicely into my next question about the the, the, the chapter that follows later from uh, uh, from Glenda Gilmore about the, the myth of the good civil rights protest, yeah. right? And I really enjoyed that one because we talk about how the, there's this high, this idea that, you know, those those were very peaceful and civil. Yeah. And of course, Martin Luther King was a very peaceful, gentle man. And one of my favorites, I don't know if you've, I'm sure you've seen it, uh, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, the documentary on Netflix. Uh, we had sold out O'Brien on the show a couple of months ago. Yeah. And she's one of the producers and shows that not not only was not Mrs. Rosa Park not this sweet old little lady who was just tired from a lot she was a young woman actually and she was one hard hitting activist yeah. right you know and so that is interesting for Glenda to go into that that this backlash but but I I do see uh, uh, the uh, so this myth um but I, I also can't help but see the action now is is similar, right? With the outburst of protest intensity, the gun deaths, yeah. the reaction, from, but the reaction from the Republican supermajority, the reaction that it, it goes to that myth that we this is the wrong way to protest, right? That yeah. that was the good yeah. protest, right? I mean, talk a little bit about what that that concept and how it frames the work, the arguments we're having today, even yeah. as we speak right yeah. now. Zoe Zephyr has been forced out of her position in the Montana legislature, is working out the hallway, right? So, do you think that good protest idea frames that that thing? Because I actually yeah, am writing absolutely. a piece right. Right now, absolutely, because so, they all so, use so, decorum, so, right? You know, oh, but decorum, yeah. right? Mm. Yeah. So what what Glenda talks about is is we've 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 reduced Martin Luther King Jr. in every possible way. 
if you if, on MLK Day, politicians, especially in the Republican Party, will trot out the only one line they think he ever spoke right. <laughs> from uh, the March on Washington about the content of their character, not the color of their skin. Yep. They've all got that one down. Yep. Um, without realizing that he was much more complex than that. Yep. Even if you, even if all you ever read from him is the "I Have a Dream" speech, yeah. it talks about police brutality, it talks about poverty, talks about militarism, talks about um, um, uh, voting rights, talks about a whole lot of other things that we're still arguing about today. So King himself was much more complex, especially later in his life. Right, but uh, the last year of his life, King's approval rating in polls is like thirty three percent. Yep. I mean, he was assassinated for a reason. A lot of people hated him. Right. But we have simplified and sterilized Martin Luther King Jr. now to the point where is a simple story of he stood up, told us all racism was bad. We erased racism. Problem solved. Right. So he's become very simple in both his argument, but also his tactics. Right. Right. King was disruptive. Yeah. Right. They held demonstrations to demonstrate how deeply racist uh, America could be in a variety of ways, the government, private businesses, lots of different complaints here. And they did so in ways that were disruptive. You often hear people say, oh, well, this march is going to block traffic or it's going to hurt downtown business. That's the point. You want to disrupt things in order to get people's attention. Right. But again, we have sterilized and sanitized King to the point, as Glenda notes in his piece, that he has become this saint that everyone loves and no one can imagine anyone was upset with. And what that does is it removes King at some distance from protest today. And they hold up that false image of King as a counterpoint to Black Lives Matter and other groups today to say, you're not protesting the right way. Right. Actually, they're protesting just like King. Right. I mean, it was remarkable in terms of their complaints, in terms of the strategies, in terms of the techniques, yep. in terms of the PR reach. It's all a lot of the same. I mean, there are some differences, but I mean, the echoes there are really important. But this issue of this image of the good civil rights protest uh, is meant to undercut any kind of effort to draw a connection between the past and the present when it really is there. Right. And you see it. And I was I was actually doing some research today. And it was interesting to me that in the, the three cases I'm looking at right now, we've all seen right Tennessee, the, the Tennessee three uh, in Montana with uh, Miss Zephyr being kicked out with um, uh, others. Uh, the quote they're, that they're actually saying to kick these legislators out and silence them is decorum. They violated yeah. decorum, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and this sounds eerily familiar to me, right? They didn't like how the kids were like, and oh, I was bringing up the one in Texas. I don't know if you saw the video from Texas last night where the state troopers beat up oh, yeah. some LGBTQ yeah. Um, yeah. T activists because the House Speaker felt they were violating decorum, right? So that it almost feels like here we are. I mean, if they could just, I, I think you just threw sepia tone on these videos, we'd be right back yeah. where we were, right? Yeah. I mean, it, and, it, the, and the complaint about decorum was one king got all the time, right? right? You know, you're being rude, you're being too too aggressive, you're being too pushy, you're violating our sense of peace. He talks about this in the letter from a Birmingham jail. He right. talks directly to white moderates who are saying, go slow, yes. you're pushing too hard, you're being too rude. Yep. Right. And, and so, and what I find amazing is when these state legislators keep on saying, oh, we don't want any critical race theory. In Texas, they said, you should read two things, the March on Washington speech and the letter from a Birmingham jail. Terrific. I think the, the person suggesting that should actually read them because I don't think he has. Right. Because they're full of critical race theory. They're full right. of all this stuff, but they're complaining about today. The connections are crystal clear. Because they've already read the quotes, right? <laughs> they got the yeah. Cliff Notes version. Yeah, they know one, they they know they, one yeah, line they, and that's it. Right, exactly. And, and that leads, and that goes to the great, again, segue number 19, I think, the white backlash chapter, which is, yeah. you know, as we watch these in insane attacks on transgender care, I'm in Missouri, as I mentioned. Um, the, the, the state AG right now is trying to use a, 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 a just a, a a rule by the issue, issue a decree basically outlawing gender affirming care for any Missourian, any age, uh, by putting all these rules in place. They had to have all these things, and, and it's it's before the courts right now. It, it, it and I, I, t I read the chapter on white backlash, which was basically putting the onus on black civil rights. Yeah. You know, for it's it, and 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 I thought that was a fascinating chapter of of how the 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 idea. But here we are in 2023, and we're in exact same place. The onus is being placed on the protesters. The the woman who was beat up in Texas last night by state troopers. By the way, dozens of state troopers. While there was a manhunt allegedly for a mass murderer, they had plenty of time to go beat up peaceful yeah. protesters. And and so that backlash. So it, again, passes precedent. Here we are again 
with a backlash. And and in the last note, I'll I talk to somebody very dear to me, very close to me, who I love. And 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 this person told me this person's of the boomer generation. And, and it's Dylan Mulvaney thing and the Bud Light issue, right? Where they sent a beer can to Dylan Mulvaney, who is a transgender activist. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and, and this person said to me, well, you know, you have to understand they're just shoving it down our throats. Yeah. They're, it literally said to me, they're moving too fast. And then I read this chapter on white back and I'm like, shit. <laughs> so here we are again, Kevin, talk to me. Where do we navigate our asses out of this? I mean, yeah. it, we're, we're in yeah. the same place. Right. And I, what do I tell a protester? Like, yeah, this happened fucking 40 years ago too, or 50 years ago. Uh, yeah. It, it I mean, I mean, uh, the, the chapter you're talking about by Larry Glickman at Cornell is I think just a, a brilliant piece. And as someone who's written about uh, this topic, uh, he really helped me kind of rethink how we frame it. Is, and what Larry says is is that this trope of white backlash, that phrase backlash, uh, is really um, um, not the right one to use. Okay. Because what it does is, A, it puts all blame on the other side. That you have, in his accounting, you're talking about uh, civil rights gains by African Americans. But right. as you note, you can use this for any kind of political backlash. It's certainly true today. And what it does is it says, well, those people provoked me. Right. Right by insisting on their rights or just existing. Uh, they were shoving it down our throats. And and our response is reactive. It's not our fault. We didn't start this, yep. right? And we're going to push back on this. But also, there's a way in which the press talks about these things as if it's almost, you know, a natural phenomenon. It's balanced. Right? Like, like, well, who could, if this was inevitable, they push for civil rights, you're going to have a backlash. No, a backlash is like any other social movement. It's got people behind it. Right. It's got people who push an agenda, whether you agree with it or not. It's like any kind of social movement. They push an agenda. They get things into the the national dialogue. They are pressing for changes they want. Right. Uh, And just because it's pushing back against someone as they perceive it doesn't mean it's any less of a conscious effort. Right. Right. And so what, what Larry's piece does is take people who are engaged in white backlash seriously. Right. Treat them like you would any other social movement with an agenda, with aims, with you know, with funders or whatever, uh, and really take it seriously. And don't just assume this is a natural state of being, right? Because it lets the people engaged in this backlash off the hook. As for that trope of pushing it down our throats, uh, I could do a, you know, a Google search in newspapers for that phrase, and and it would go back to, you know, I I don't know how far back, but certainly through the 50s and 60s. Right. And what's remarkable is, again, things that now we wouldn't think of as being pushed down our throats were thought of in that way. People demanding civil rights change on the ground Catholics. representation in media Catholics. Right. I mean, when you, when you would you have almost black frame, actors yeah, on right. TV or film, Oh yeah. You're, you know, Oh, an interracial friendship, you're pushing that down our throat An interracial relationship. How dare you? You're pushing that down our throat. Right. So these things now that we all take as normal, uh, were seen at the time as things that Hollywood was pushing down our throat. So I think we need to have that longer perspective to understand that, uh, this is all part of a, a, a much longer process. Yeah, and we have to take the fight. I mean, Moms for Liberty, for example, is very well funded. It's not grassroots by any stretch of the imagination. Right. It is. It is a is a is a, a very well funded far right organization looking to. It is white backlash. It's still actually white backlash. I could argue if they're trying to get rid of CRT and you know the books they ban are ones that have to do anything to do with the African American experience or LGBTQ experience uh, as sexualizing them. And it's gotten mm-hmm. I think even more caustic with uh, everything's porn. Well, why do you want porn? No, I. I right. <laughs> Uh, it's good. You know, I'm an old soldier, um, you know, and I talk a lot in my, in, when I write and I talk about how, you know, we didn't end fascism in the forties by acting like it wasn't happening. Right. We, we, right. Didn't, we, we, the, there was a global, you know, once we were actually, we did push back for a long time, not want to participate, but when we did finally, uh, we had a war and we ended it that way. And I often say these culture war issues, um, that are somehow sometimes easily dismissed in other parts of the country are very real wars here in Missouri, for example, yeah. or places like Tennessee or Montana, where you know, they're. Um, do you think from the movements of the past, there's more our government? I mean, in your in your studies, is there more we should? Is there more the Biden administration honestly could be doing? Is there more that we as activists could be doing to fight this rising authoritarianism, and these attacks on our freedom? I mean, does history give us any guide on how is it maybe a better way for us to fight back? As we mentioned, just like this this grassroots movement, which really isn't a grassroots movement. Well, that's a great question. I mean, 
Yeah, I would say I think the Department of Justice could be a little more involved yeah. with some of these things, things on the ground. I know they've got their hands full with a million different things. Yeah, uh, I know there are good people there who who mean well. Uh, but uh, I'm always in favor of a little more uh, aggression. Yeah, uh, and by that I mean you know it's involvement, and protecting people's rights, um, and not thinking that this is something that is uh, kind of fair game up for political debate. There are certain um, uh, lines of safety and, and, and citizenship that should be preserved for all of us. Uh, right. and I think the, the DOJ probably has his hands full there, but it could be doing more. Yeah. Um, I think what we can all do on our own is to push back against the, the you know, the framing of this as, you know, uh, again, I, and I use the culture war framing myself, but I think it's probably a mistake because it implies there are kind of two equal sides fighting over something that's kind of up in the air when right. it really is, you know, marginalized communities fighting for their very existence, if not their lives. Yep. Uh, and, and that I think is, is troubling. Um, uh, uh, and, and I think we can all kind of stand up for that uh, a, a little more firmly. Yep. Uh, the media, I think, uh, has a responsibility. Uh, I know they are constantly going on these kind of, uh, you know, Trump diner safaris. Uh, 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 you're probably getting them in Missouri. I'm sure they yep. love Ohio and Pennsylvania, yep. but Missouri will get them too. Um and, you know, it's important to try to understand where people are coming from, but there's a line between understanding and validating. Uh, and uh, and what we learned in the 60s is we had the kind of, you know, far fringe cranks out there. They didn't get a national spotlight. They weren't interviewed on Meet the Press, you know, or Face the Nation. Um, you know, they maybe had a, uh, you know, a mimeographed handbill that uh, reached a small audience. Half a million followers uh, thanks to on Twitter. Twitter and social media, they've yep. got a national platform already. I don't know why the media feels the need to, to kind of amplify them, uh, but they do. But I think we've got to really uh, be aware of it. This isn't just politics as usual, right? There is, as we noted at the start, a much more authoritarian trend taking place in the Republican Party. Uh, and, and I think it's reaching an alarming point. Right. Uh, and, and I think we all need to be on guard in it. And uh, I think the last thing I'll say is uh, to dovetail back to something we touched on a couple of times. A lot of this is happening at the state level. Right. And I think for the for the national media, the shiny object has long been national politics. And they kind of assume, you know, local media is going to cover the state house. Well, local media has been eviscerated. And right. so uh, I think we all need to, to really be watching what's going on in these state legislatures. I'm from Tennessee. The Tennessee uh, 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 state house has been uh, in national news for interesting reasons lately. Uh, and we're seeing a light shine on, on these people who aren't used to it. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, there was a comedian, I think, who had a line about uh, most people are who are in state politics are only there because they have skeletons in their closet that preclude them from rising to higher office. <laughs> uh, so there's going to be a lot I think they can dig up there. Yeah. And it's interesting that you, you, you got to the point. Uh, Tennessee Holler. Uh, are the folks that exposed, you know, he's a great, it's like a one man show is exposing all this stuff in Tennessee. Great stuff. And, yeah. that, and that's that horrifying story out of Oklahoma where they caught him on tape talking about actually murdering journalists, yeah. you know, and uh, that was caught by a local paper that doesn't even a have local a paper, website. One of them, one of doesn't even have yeah. a website. They had to use a QR code on their print paper right? so people could get the tape. So you're right. I mean, the power of those locals, uh, and, and I think it's gratifying to me because I, I, we joke on the show a lot that I'm still weirdly optimistic about things. I don't know how it's possible, but you're right. <laughs> and and that weird optimism is just that 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 there's yeah. that the, the the power of that that larger social media and, and, the, and the connection we have is that those folks are getting the attention they need. I think last question I'll, I'll go to on 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 topical is is you know I, I more of a personal one as we kind of wrap like look I don't think this is what you planned on when you got your PhD <laughs> right I, I don't think I don't I mean you've you've put up with a lot of attacks I've I've watched mm -hmm. it unfold I've been I've been blessed to follow you for many years now um you know you've put up with the like I said the Dinesh D'Souza and the nut jobs yeah. and you were part of the 1690 project that came with a whole baggage full of, you know, you've yep. had you've had people go through your writings I mean how did you get here to this moment where you went from you know, let's face it, most historians sit in like offices like you're there with books and they're dusty and <laughs> you're writing your books, you know, but you're much more active. You're a different kind of historian. How did you get to this moment where you're so involved in our national discussion? Uh, I was dragged in kicking and screaming. Um, <laughs> like so I, many of us, yeah, right? <laughs> I, I, the idea that I would, if you told my wife, uh, you know, a decade ago that her husband was going to be on social media and be known, she would have <laughs> laughed at you. I didn't have a cell phone until 2002. I was uh, never on Facebook or anything like that. I was a Luddite for that stuff. I mean, uh, but it was my my publisher, uh, my second book uh, came out in 2015. Um, uh, basic Books said, you know, you got to be on, on Twitter these days. We want our office to be on Twitter to, to do this stuff. And so I was on there for, you know, six months or so doing kind of 
on this day in history, this happened. Right. It's fine. That's fine. But who cares? Uh, it was real anodyne stuff and it felt fake. And then it was actually the, the fight over the Confederate monument right. in the, what 2015. I, That's what I, I saw some you. really wrong, just fundamentally wrong takes about Southern history, about Southern politics, mm-hmm. about uh, the civil rights struggle, about the civil war mm-hmm. online. And I just, I, I it just broke me. And I found out, I was like, okay, I'm coming out swinging and I don't care anymore. And I'm not going to just be kind of the nice ask a historian. Uh, I'm going to weigh in as I really feel here. Uh, and and it was kind of liberating. I found that there are people out there who were really uh, engaged in it. And I was by no means the only one, definitely not the first. Um, uh, but a lot of historians were on there. And we discovered, you know, there's a real hunger for history out there. Right. right? And, and, and I think like doctors have a duty to push back against the anti-vaccine nonsense or a climate scientist to push back against the global warming hoaxes. Historians have a certain set of expertise and we can't assume the general public has it. Uh, They they don't have it, Uh, but they want it. And so we have a duty like those other groups to get involved, to come out of the, I could easily have stayed in the ivory tower. I I would have been much more productive. I would have more books. I would have, I would have more money. It would have been much better in every way. I would have had more sleep, less stress in my life. Um, But, uh, I think we have a duty to push back against this. And as you know, on, on social media, um, a lot of people who uh, are from different marginalized communities catch a lot of shit on there. Yep. And I am a straight white Christian male. I'm a tenured professor at a private institution in the Northeast. I have no excuse not to wait in here. I catch for all the crap I catch, I catch 1% yeah. of what some of my colleagues get. So I have no excuse to hold back. So I had to develop some very thick skin mm-hmm. uh, and, and wade into it. But I really do think it's um, it's something that there's a, a, a need for. And luckily, a lot of us have kind of waded into the trenches to try to do it. Well, it matters. I mean, that's why I ca- that's why I stumbled on you too, right? That that time frame with the monuments yeah. and the deal, what we were dealing with there in Virginia, I was living there. Um, and that battle for the, the soul of our nation. And that's kind of what I think, with, and that's what I'll finish on, is this is a battle for the soul of our nation. This is the yeah. battle for America. And what is America really? And and what is America for everyone? Because uh, like you said, men that look like us, two white males with with very much privileges. I used to give speeches about my entrepreneurship journey. And then uh, like I was some kind of hero because I, I lost my job and I started a business. And I was like, wait a minute, I went to Harvard for grad school on the Army's dime. <laughs> okay, you know... <laughs> Maybe that's yeah. not such a hard scrabble story after all, you know what I mean? And yeah. and then and it kind of had this transformation. It was about the same time as yours. I was like, wait a minute. I used to be conservative. And I went, a young woman came to work for me and somebody said, how can you work for that right wing nut job? And this is like 2011. <laughs> and and I was like, wait a minute. I, I maybe I am. Maybe I'm not seeing the real story here of, of mm-hmm. myself. And uh, and then I'll leave this. Um, and I just to just blow smoke up you again is, um, you know, it's funny. We talk about the 1619, the traffic and, you know, Pete Buttigieg being beat up, saying that um, infrastructure is racist. Right. Yeah. I used to live here in there's an area called Richmond Heights and Richmond Heights is where St. Louis is known as a brick town. It used to be, you know, where yeah. they made brick. Those bricks were made in Richmond Heights. And if you take the highway out of St. Louis, highway um, 40, it goes straight. And then it takes, it's this, takes this right turn right after Forest Park that makes no sense. It causes a traffic jam every single day yep. and it goes right through Richmond Heights. I was walking my evening walk that I do three miles a day. And there's a marker talking about how this area was, where the brick factories built the brick laborers houses, <laughs> the black mm-hmm. laborers. And that's where they put the highway, <laughs> you know? And, and I, and I remember going, I always go back to your sky. I lived in Richmond, which is where you focused on. I lived in Atlanta, which you focused on. <laughs> and uh, it is, it is so important for us to understand those difference. It's so important for us to understand mm-hmm. how these things are occurring. So when the transportation secretary says, we got a problem in our infrastructure, it's destroying communities and it's marginalizing middle. We understand that. So Kevin, I appreciate you. So for one old white guy who didn't get it until he read some of your stuff, thank you. <laughs> you know, if it matters to you, 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 you got hold of one asshole, and that's me. <laughs> so, all right, there you go. Done, right? I appreciate you. <laughs> Where can we find you, brother? Where can we find you online? Where can we find your stuff? Obviously, Myth America's out in uh, all the uh, best Twitter. I'm stores. on the, the Blue Sky thing now, which oh, I think cool. going to be the, the next one. Um, uh, I'm in bookstores everywhere, so look there. <laughs> well, it's a terrific book, you know, and I love it. It's, it's well written. Obviously, there's tr- talented writers, and, and I appreciate you. I really appreciate oh, your time. Thanks. thanks for joining us, and uh, look forward to, to harassing you on Twitter again soon. My pleasure. I'll see you there. See you, brother. Man, what a great conversation with Kevin. Uh, just a brilliant, 
historian and a participant in our conversations. And uh, I, I literally, I'm kind of gushy today, so forgive me. I, I've been a super fan for a while. <laughs> uh, as you can see, we're on the Myest Touch Network now. Our show regularly posts Friday nights at 11 p.m. Eastern, uh, 8 p.m. Pacific. If you subscribe to our Substack, though, fpwellman.substack.com. Matt will put it on screen for us. If you subscribe, you'll get it a whole day early. If you're a fan, you can you can catch it a day early. I'll post it to subscribe, Substack uh, about 24 hours early, and, and of course, it's on our YouTube channels. Please follow the, the podcast. is on Democracy Pod on Twitter, as well as on Democracy Podcast on YouTube. I, as always, is I'm at FP Wellman on Twitter, FP Wellman official on Instagram. And of course, on the Minus Touch Network, we're putting out some really fun shorts, some hot takes. I did one on Ron DeSantis and Disney. I did another on the, the, the ridiculous things and the, the debt ceiling bill that the Republicans passed that cut a lot of the veterans' benefits that we've gotten so used to. Uh, I would encourage you to check out Minus Touch if you're not finding us there. It's a, it's a great place to hang out and find like minded folks. I joke a lot that it's kind of fun to read the comments on Minus Touch because people are actually fun and cool and we have great conversations in the comments. So I really would love, I try to go through them. Sometimes there's several thousand, but I try to go through the comments to say hi. So I'd love for your feedback. I really do. In the meantime, like, share, comment, tell your friends about the show, tell your friends about our Substack. We really welcome the community we built around this organization and this show. And, and, and thank you. As always, we're sponsored by our friends here at Half Coast Media's owner, Vi Media. Uh, Vi Media is a digital marketing firm based right here in St. Louis with a national footprint for all your digital marketing needs. They've been great to me here at the studio and, and welcome me as a member of their family. That's Vi.media, V-I-E.media on the internet. I hope you check them out. And uh, In the meantime, download the show. I look forward to talking to you. We're still in the fight for our democracy. Keep up the fight. See you next week.